invite you to join us for the morning worship service of Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church. We welcome you as we worship the Lord together. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, help us to worship Thee in the holiness of beauty, that some beauty of holiness may appear in us. Lift us above the shadow of sin, that we may find Thy will for our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Our opening hymn is number 124, Ask Ye What Great Thing I Know. Let us stand in his Richard lines out the hymn. Let us speak to one another. Welcome each other to this service uh, of worship through the, in the name of Jesus Christ. Hymn number 124. faith is the Apostles' Creed. Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
We welcome you to our worship service today. It's good to have you here on this third Sunday in Lent. We would like to have a record of your attendance, so please take out the registration forms and fill in the who's who in the pew. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here. We want you to fill this out completely. Give us your name, your address, and your telephone number so that we can get in touch with you at a later time. As you look in your bulletin, there are a number of announcements that you see. There are a few that I want to call your attention to this morning. First of all, today we will be going by our regular schedule with the choirs, the MYF, the snack supper. We will conclude the day's activities with our evening worship service in the chapel at 7.30 p.m. Uh, tonight we will be considering Exodus 17, 3 through 7, and the grace of God. Uh, we have as our special music tonight uh, Miss Kelly O'Neill. know that many of you will want to be here and to be a part of that service tonight, so we encourage you to come and be a part of our evening worship service as we have a little bit more of an informal worship tonight at 7.30. On Wednesday night, we have our regular Wednesday night supper. These have been going very, very well over the last uh, few months. Uh, to, this Wednesday night, we have a Hawaiian luau. We are celebrating uh, our international month. We have eaten Italian food and Chinese food, and we have had Irish food. And this upcoming week, we've got Polynesian food as we make our trip around the globe. Uh, we invite you to come and to wear your Hawaiian shirts and wear your grass skirts, ladies. And uh, I think that we'll have a, a very good time this Wednesday night. Supper begins at 6.24 p.m. You can make a reservation by filling out the reservation form on the back of your bulletin and dropping that in the offering plate or giving us a call at the church office to let us know that you're coming. Uh, the menu is, of course, Hawaiian. Uh, Hawaiian sesame chicken with snow peas, rice, fruit kebabs, Hawaiian bread, Hawaiian cake, and beverage. Uh, we have a good time at our Wednesday night suppers. We'd love to have you come and be a part of it. Also this week... We uh, are celebrating the birthdays of all the people who have had birthdays in the month of March. If you had a birthday in March, please come and be our guest on Wednesday night. Also, we will be putting your name into the pot uh, to draw it out for the birthday cake that we'll be giving away this Wednesday night. And the cake uh, this month has been prepared by Mrs. Isabel Pennington, so it ought to be good. And we hope that all of you will come and be a part of our Wednesday night fellowship this upcoming Wednesday night. On Saturday, the junior highs are having their garage sale. You've been hearing a good bit about it the last month or so. Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, the fellowship hall doors will open, and you can come and get all the rummage that you would care to take home. Uh, understand that they still do need a few things. If you have some heavy things that you have been unable to bring up to the church, uh, understand that you can call Dave Benson here at the church, and he'll be glad to swing by your house and pick up the heavier rummage that you can't bring up here yourself. But you need to call him before Thursday. After Thursday, I think he uh, is just going to rest and wait until Saturday. So that the junior high garage sale coming up at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. Uh, incidentally, the proceeds for this are a part of the uh, building fund pledge by our youth. They pledge $10,000 over a three-year period of time, and this is a part of their raising the money that they need to meet their pledge for this year. So let's help out the junior highs and, uh, and come and support their rummage sale on Saturday. I'd like to give another announcement uh, for young people. Those of you who are now at the age of accountability and would like to uh, profess Christ as your Lord and Savior and unite with this church, we are starting our confirmation class April the 26th here at the church. Uh, we have sent invitations to all those in the fifth grade already. A number of them have responded and want to be in the class this year. Uh, if we have overlooked any young people in the church that would like to come and to be a part of the confirmation class this year, please give me a call at the church office this week, and uh, we'll certainly get you down on the list and look forward to seeing you on April the 26th uh, when we start our confirmation class. The beautiful flowers on our altar today have been placed to the glory of God and are in loving honor of Dr. Hoke Sewell and in appreciation of the visiting teachers by the Smith Sunday School class. Come to seek your face, O oh Lord. We've come to worship you. We've come to sense your 
makes us glad already that we've come into the house of the Lord this day. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O God, our Father, in this sweet hour of prayer, we come humbly before Thee to make our prayer requests known. We are thankful for our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in this Lenten season, we focus our eyes attentively upon Him, upon His life, upon His teachings, upon His death upon the cross for us. O Lord, we anticipate with great hope the celebration again of His resurrection. And we pray that Thou would impart Thy Holy Spirit upon us this morning to comfort us, to counsel us, to encourage us in this hour. We pray Thy blessings upon our church through which we worship and serve Thee. We're thankful for the many blessings of life that have been bestowed upon us through Trinity on the Hill, through the ministers that have served us, who have encouraged us, through lay people who have reached out to us and cared for us, with genuine Christian concern. We're thankful for this youth girls ensemble that just sang for us. We're thankful that our hearts have been lifted to thee this morning by the words of the hymns that we have sung. We're thankful for this opportunity of prayer and we pray that thou would bless us with thy spirit. We are grateful this morning for thy many blessings and we desire to show thee our thanks, our praise, and our joy in this hour but we acknowledge that we have done things that we ought not to have done and we have left undone many things that we should have done. And we come this morning asking thy forgiveness of the sins that we have committed. We have been greedy of things in life. We have become angry with one another and we have mistrusted other people and we have mistrusted thee when we ought to have trusted thee. We have had fearful hearts. We have become anxious and troubled about things that we certainly should have had peace and not been troubled. We have been indifferent to thee, and we pray that thou would forgive us for being defeated by doubt and having misgivings about our Christian walk. We pray that thou would bring light to our path, that we might not walk in darkness, and that we might not sin against thee. We pray this morning for those who are sick, who are lonely, who are alone, and who are in crisis situations. 
We pray for people everywhere who are facing tribulation and trial. We pray that thou would strengthen them and encourage them and lead them not into temptation. Our Father, we pray for students who are in school. We pray that as they celebrate spring break, that they will come back renewed and ready to study and to become better equipped to go out into the world. And we pray that thou would equip us all to change the world for thee. We pray for this church that as we continue to reach out to one another that thou would give us a vision of what we ought to be doing and the strength to attempt it and to accomplish thy will. Lord, keep us faithful to the tasks that are before us. Keep us sensitive to the needs of other people and fortify us when we stand the tests of life. Inform our minds and our hearts with thy truth and create in us a passion to testify with our lives what Christ has done for us. Lord, we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, thy Son, our Lord, remembering the words that he taught us to use when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our hymn of preparation is found on page 267. Open my eyes that I may see. We're going to stand and sing all three verses of this hymn. And on the last verse, would the children please come forward for the children's sermon. Hymn number 267.
How y'all doing today? Good, good. I've got a story I want to tell y'all, but first, how many of you have ever seen a turtle? Has everybody seen a turtle? Yeah, most everybody's seen what a turtle looks like. They're, they've got a shell on the back of their, their back, and sometimes they draw all their legs and their head up in the turtle and the shell and everything, and you can't ever get to them. It's a very hard shell, but you know that shell looks like it's been broken, doesn't it? It's just got marks all over it, and it's just, it's just jagged, and it's real funny looking. And a lot of people have wondered why the turtle has that kind of a shell, kind of a rounded, but it looks like it's been cracked, shell. But the people of South America tell this story about a, a turtle named Martin. And I'm going to tell you all that story this morning. It seems that there was a turtle named Martin. And Martin wasn't just satisfied to walk along the ground and whenever somebody tried to come along and, and get him, he would draw up inside his shell. He decided that he wanted to be like the birds and be able to fly away from things. And he had a lot of friends that were birds. And so he went and he told them his plight. He wanted to learn to fly. And they said, well, Martin, the first thing you need in order to be able to fly is, a, is some wings. So all the birds got together and, and decided that they would each take out one wing and uh, a feather and give it to Martin. And thereby, he could build himself some wings. And so that's what Martin did. He put them all together and tied them all together and put them up underneath him. And pretty soon, he could fly like all the other birds. And he could go anywhere he wanted to. And everybody marveled at how Martin the turtle could fly. Well, all the birds got invited to a far-off mountain by Mr. Hawk. Mr. Hawk was having a big party, and all the birds were invited. And Martin wanted to go with them. And so he flew alongside all the other birds to Mr. Hawk's party on a far-off mountain. Well, he flew over there, and when he got there, Mr. Hawk was kind of upset to see Martin there, and he said, you don't look like the rest of the birds. But the other birds said, oh, Martin's a good friend of ours. And so Mr. Hawk said, well, if he's a friend of y'all's, then he's a friend of mine. But Martin had one terrible, terrible problem, and that was that he loved to eat. He ate and ate and ate whatever was in sight. And when he got to this party, he just could not control himself. And he started eating everything that was at the table. He ate the potato chips and the dip. He ate all the olives. He ate all the dessert. He ate all the sandwiches, the pimento cheese sandwiches. And none of the other birds could get anything. And Mr. Hulk got madder and madder and madder. He said, I didn't even invite this fellow. And here he's coming eating up all my food. So he got all the birds and said, let's get rid of him. It's time to ditch Martin. So all the birds started pecking at Martin and just trying, and Martin drew up into his shell and they kept kicking him and moving him further to the cliff and Martin went sailing right over the side of the cliff and he broke the back of his shell. Well, he decided what he'd do is try to piece it all back together with cement and glue and everything, but it just never did quite all fit back together. And from that day on, the turtle has had a broken looking shell. It's been pieced back together put back together because of Martin get, having it broken. Well, we know that things can get broken and it's hard to put them back together. If you break your mama's vase or a table lamp or something, it's hard to piece that thing back together and make it look like it did before it was broken. And that's the way it is also with some other things like promises. If we break a promise, it's hard to put back our relationship with another person. If we tell somebody, I promise I'll do this, and you don't do it, that person's going to be mad at you. And it's hard for them to get over that. So the thing that I'm trying to emphasize is every time you see a turtle, remember, don't break a promise because you, you can't put it back together the way it used to be. Don't ever, try to, don't ever break a promise, especially a promise to God. Let's try to keep our promises and keep from looking like that turtle, Martin. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for thy blessings upon us, for these children, and for the lessons of life. We pray that thou would help us all to realize that it's very important that we keep our promises that we make to thee and to other people. Help us not to break our promises that we've made to thee, and help us to keep from being like that turtle martin. Help us to keep our lives in order, and keep our slates clean. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
this time we'll ask the ushers to come and receive the morning offering. strength, for support, for love, we give thanks, O oh God, to bring light, strength, support, and love to others. We dedicate these gifts and our lives to the service of your kingdom in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture lesson this morning is found in the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. I'll be reading verses 1 through 12. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, Why is he? He said, I do not know. May God add his blessings to the reading of this his holy word. I do not believe that anything has bothered people more than the fact of human suffering. In the midst of suffering, whether it is personal and near at home, or whether it is somewhere involving people on the other side of the world, we find ourselves asking again and again, why do people suffer? A mother stands by the bedside of her stricken child and asks why. A young husband and father is killed in a senseless accident and his widow asks the question, why? Why is there so much needless pain in God's world? Why doesn't God do something about it? Why does God let it happen? What is the point of all this? These questions and others like them have haunted people down through the ages. And these questions in every age have clamored for an explanation. We see something of this in the scripture lesson of the morning. Jesus and his disciples were walking along one Sabbath day near Jerusalem when suddenly they came upon a blind beggar by the road. You would expect an expression of pity from the disciples since they had been with Jesus for these years and had seen his compassion and his concern when he met someone who was in trouble or someone who was suffering. But instead of an expression of pity, they started a theological discussion over this fellow and his blinded condition. Rabbi, they ask, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus replied, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. I do not believe we will ever, this side of heaven, find the full answer to the problem of suffering. But here in this answer, which Jesus gave his disciples, 
we can see at least one facet of his view concerning suffering. And from this one facet, we can learn some important lessons about suffering and about God's glory in suffering. Basically, basically if you, as we read these verses, we find Jesus teaching the disciples three lessons. Three lessons can be gleaned from these words of Jesus. The first lesson is this. All suffering is not due to sin. All suffering is not due to sin. If you notice the question these disciples ask, they were not having the trouble that we have. I said to you that we are always asking the question, why? Why did this happen? Why did this particular tragedy occur in someone's life? The disciples didn't ask the question, why? They asked the question, who? And the reason they asked the question, who, rather than the question, why, is because they assumed in their question that all suffering is caused by sin. On their doubt was, or their doubt in the matter was, did this come about in this man's life because of his uh, uh, sinning or because of the sins of his parents? Back in those days, a person uh, could look at a crippled person or a blind person or a leper with part of his limbs eaten away and just walk on by and say without any compassion, without any pity, without any concern, he's getting what he deserves. He's paying for his sins. The rabbis believed there was no such thing as innocent suffering. They believed that wherever there was suffering, there was sin. And they even believed in prenatal sin. They thought a baby could sin even before it was born. And they also believed that terrible punishments came on certain people because of the sins of their parents. And this is an idea which is strongly expressed in the Old Testament. If you turn, if you turn to the 20th chapter of Exodus, where we have the first uh, listing of the Ten Commandments, you will find in the sixth verse, it's plainly said that children may be punished to the third and fourth generations for the sins of their parents. So this is where the disciples were coming from when they asked the question of Jesus, not why is he blind, but who sinned? This man or his parents? Jesus was quick to dispel the idea that the man's blindness was due to sin. When he said that neither this man nor his parents sinned, he didn't mean really that they were free from sin. But he was saying that the disciples were not justified in assuming that sin was the explanation for the blindness of this man. And how long, how long will it take us to learn this lesson taught by our master? You have known, and I have known, good people when some great tragedy came into their life 
who are made doubly misery, miserable by the thought that it must be due to some special sin in their life. And so they immediately, immediately began asking, what have I done to cause this to happen to me? Of course, they're asking a question as old as humankind. We see this same question way back in the book of Job. Job lived in a time when people believe, even more than they do now, that God would do good to those who pleased him and would punish those who displeased him. And it was just at this point that Job encountered his problem. He had examined his own heart and could find in himself no cause of offense to God. He had done his best to serve God, but still tragedy came. Now, no one can deny the terrible consequences of sinful living. Many of our illnesses, illnesses come from wrong living. Broken homes usually result from sin of some kind. War, with all of its destruction and suffering, comes from sin. Jesus is not here denying the fact that sin causes suffering. Sin does cause suffering. But he is saying that it is a false simplification to say that all suffering is due to sin. And we know this is true. There is too much undeserved suffering in the world not to believe that. Jesus' response to the question of his disciples doesn't solve all the mystery of or the reason for suffering. But it does tell us that all suffering is not due to sin. His, que his answer to the disciples' question also tells us something else. It tells us that God can take our suffering and give it meaning. On first reading of this particular scripture, it, it, you may get the idea or it may sound like the man was born blind just so this particular miracle could be performed. But this truth goes much deeper than that. Dr. West, uh, Leslie Weatherhead, the well-known English preacher, has done the entire Christian community a great service by publishing his thoughts on the will of God in a little book simply entitled the will of God. It's the best book I've ever read on this particular subject. And in that book, Weatherhead says that a lot of things happen to us that are not the will of God. But nothing can happen to us that cannot be captured for God. God can give our suffering meaning. So often the trouble about suffering is it seems so senseless, so meaningless. We will endure almost anything if we can see some meaning in it. And this is what Jesus is trying to show us here. He is saying that God can do something with this man's suffering and so give meaning to it. In this particular instance, God took the suffering away and afforded this man a great faith. In other times, in other instances, he does not take the suffering away, but he does use it redemptively. Dr. Arthur Gossett 
tells of a minister whose wife died suddenly, leaving him utterly desolate. After a time, this minister wrote a sermon in which he reached out to get hold of the hand of God in this terrible tragedy in his life. Several years after he preached this sermon, the sermon was published. And since the publication date until the time of the minister's death, hundreds of letters came to him from all over the world telling him that it was not for nothing that his heart was broken. Two people who had been through deep waters wrote, it had to break that God through you might help and steady and save our stunned, lost souls. My friends, we can't understand all the reason for suffering, but we can accept our high calling to let God have it, let Him use it, and through our loss or pain or sorrow, let the work of God be manifest. All suffering is not due to sin. God can give meaning to our suffering. And now the final lesson we can learn from Jesus' response to the disciples' question about the blind man. He says to them, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. Jesus was insisting that human suffering is always an urgent summons to Christ-like service. Human suffering is not just a subject for speculation. Life is short, and we have work to do that demands all our energies. In the King James Version, this verse says, I must do the work. But in most of the other translations, and in, old, in the older uh, Older translations doesn't say I must work. It says we must work. We must work to do the work of him who sent me. It is not only our Lord who is called to do the works of God until the night comes. We are called to do the same work with him. William Blount Barclay says, to help a fellow man who needs that help is to manifest the glory of God, for it is to show what God is like. The story is told of two men who were looking over the hideous sights of a battlefield during World War I where the battle had just ended. Of course, World War I, they fought differently than, in, uh, than today, in a sense. I mean, you had the battlefields, the battle would be fought, and then the day of dead and the dying would be left there, and you'd have a, a quiet, seems like a quiet, peaceful time after a certain battle was fought in a particular area. They were standing there looking over this hideous sight of the battlefield where the battle had just ended. Both of them were silent for a time as they stood there looking over the battlefield. But then one of them could stand it no longer. And he exclaimed, Where is God now? Where is he in all of that down there? 
The other man remained silent for a while until suddenly they saw two stretcher bearers making their way out into the zone of fire. Then the second man exclaimed, There he is. There's God now. To help a fellow who needs that help is to manifest the glory of God. For it is to show what God is like. So the lessons the disciples learned that day when a blind man was healed in Jerusalem are these. All suffering is not due to sin. God can give our suffering meaning as his work is manifested through it. Suffering is a summons to Christ-like service. What truths these scriptures contain, what truths with which to stab us today in this day in which we live, may we learn these lessons well. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the truth of thy scriptures and for the lessons we may learn as we listen to thee, as we listen to God's word through thee and through his word, the Bible. We thank thee for these lessons learned today. We know that in all of our lives there comes trouble, there comes suffering, And we ask that as when we go through this valley of darkness, help us to know that these lessons which Jesus told the disciples concerning the man born blind are lessons which all may also may apply to our own lives. And in faith, may we accept them, may we believe them, and may we in strength in thy strength, do in every situation of life that which thou dost call us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 107. Number 107, let us stand as we sing. All verses of Jesus calls us over the tumult.
grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion with the Holy Spirit be with you all. This has been the worship service from Timothy on the Hill, United Methodist Church, a production of Timothy Methodist Television, as an outreach ministry to those that we are to air. If you found this to be a meaningful service, let us hear from you by calling 738 or writing Trinity on the Hill, 1330 Monticello Avenue, Augusta, Georgia, 